I'm Tracy Sable tonight on EWTN News Nightly, down to business. President Biden tackles the border crisis with Mexico's leader. Why the Latin American president says the world has taken the wrong approach. The 51st state, how Democratic lawmakers are leading the charge in support of Puerto Rican statehood. Grave sin, the Vatican warns the faithful about the dangers of Freemasonry. And walking in faith, sport of Bible verse on the court with these new sneakers. These stories and more tonight. From EWTN, the Global Catholic Network, this is EWTN News Nightly. Thank you for being with us on the Feast of St. Elizabeth of Hungary. Our top story tonight, President Joe Biden meets with Mexico's president to discuss critical issues plaguing both countries. The two leaders spoke at the APEC summit in San Francisco about migration and drug trafficking. The powerful opioid fentanyl has become the deadliest drug in the U.S. today, killing thousands of Americans every year. White House correspondent Owen Jensen reports. Owen. Tracy, good evening to you. Tonight, President Joe Biden wants Mexico to block fentanyl. It's blamed for two-thirds of the drug overdose deaths here in the United States. Of course, whether their talks help at all remains to be seen. President Joe Biden and Mexican President Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, who have not had the friendliest of relationships, sitting down in San Francisco to talk about their country's challenges. We're working side by side to combat arms trafficking, to combat uh, tackle organized crime, and to address the opioid epidemic and including fentanyl. We are sincerely committed to continue to assist at our fullest capacity to prevent drug trafficking. On the table, deadly fentanyl trafficking. Mexico and China, the primary sources for the synthetic drug trafficked into the U.S. Earlier this week, President Biden secured an agreement with China's President Xi to curb the illicit opioid. The goal, fewer deaths. With this new understanding, we're taking action to significantly reduce the flow of precursor chemicals and pill presses from China to the Western Hemisphere. It's going to save lives, and I appreciate President Xi's commitment on this issue. Also on today's agenda with Mexico, the challenge of migration, specifically the southern border. President Biden's poll numbers have dropped. Reuters says Americans' concerns over immigration are at their highest level in four years. We've seen our cooperation to address historic levels of migration. And I want to thank you, Mr. President, and your team. I really mean it for the cooperation and your leadership in taking on this challenge. I know it's not easy. Democrats begging for federal assistance to help care for migrant families families living in squalid shelters and sleeping in police stations, while Republicans call President Biden's border policies too lax. Congress has not passed an immigration overhaul in decades. Now, for its part, Mexico wants the U.S. to resume talks with Cuba and end U.S. sanctions. Meantime, President Biden heads back to Delaware tonight. At the White House, Owen Jensen, EWTN News Nightly. Well, joining us now is Alfonso Aguilar, president of the Latino Partnership for Conservative Principles. Alfonso, great to have you back on. Uh, first off, your thoughts on the meeting between President Biden and President Obrador. Uh, frankly, I think it's inconsequential. Uh, the border is out of control. The president's not willing to change his policies, which are the cause of what's happening. Um, and President Obrador, López Obrador, has actually said this since the beginning of the Biden administration. Uh, he said it a couple of times that it is the Biden open board, uh, open doors, uh, open borders policies that have unleashed this massive wave of migration that not only affects uh, the U.S. but it also affects Mexico. These migrants are coming through Mexican territory, and this massive movement of people is what facilitates drug trafficking and the entry of fentanyl through our border, because uh, even though the fent most of the fentanyl comes through uh, our po uh, ports of entry, our border patrol is overwhelmed uh, 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 managing this flow, massive flow of people to be able to do their interd interdiction work to stop the entry of fentanyl. So Mexico is very frustrated with the Biden administration, and the relationship is really, it really has deteriorated. Uh, during the Trump years, we actually had a very productive and effective bilateral relationship with Mexico, and López Obrador actually acknowledged that.
Al Alfonso, obviously, you know, the two big issues really, as we see it right now, immigration and the fentanyl crisis. Um, what do you think both countries need to do right now? What concrete steps do they need to take to solve these crises? Well, I think it really starts with the U.S. I mean, if you want to look at the root causes of the border crisis, it's at the White House. So first, uh, we need operational control of, of the border. That means uh, expanding the wall system, but most importantly, um, dealing with the asylum, uh, our asylum system. The Biden administration has allowed uh, is uh, the, uh, the abuse of the asylum system. Anybody arrives to the border, uh, asks for asylum, even if they don't have a legitimate claim to asylum, they're going to be let in. And that's why we see so many people coming in. That has to change. We have to discourage people from coming into the uh, coming to our border. And once Mexico sees that, then they'll be willing to work with us to, uh, so they can take action to actually uh, discourage uh, people from going through their territory. I think we can also work with Mexico to reestablish the um, uh, uh, remaining Mexico policy, which really allowed us to, uh, to effectively get operational control of the border during the Trump years. Alfonso, we have probably about 30 seconds left or so. Uh, but one thing that was not discussed, I mean, as far as we know, is the uptick in violence against the Catholic Church in Mexico. What is the latest on that, do you know? And what is Mexico doing to try and stop it? Well, Mexico is doing very little. Uh, I'm surprised that President Biden talks about human rights abuses, the killings of journalists, human rights abuses against uh, LGBT people, but he doesn't talk about the continuous uh, murder of uh, Catholic priests in Mexico. In the past uh, 10 years, over 35 priests have been killed. Uh, just in the, four, the last four years, nine Catholic priests have been killed. He doesn't say anything. Also, uh, uh, Catholic politicians can say talk publicly against certain policies like trans issues or or express their pro-life views without being penalized by the uh, Electoral uh, uh, Institute in Mexico. Uh, that's an attack on, on the basic fundamental uh, 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 freedom of, of religious freedom, and the Biden administration doesn't say anything about it. So Mexico is doing very little, and the United States is not talking about uh, the, 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 the basic, the egregious violation of, uh, of religious freedom in Mexico. Well, Alfonso, always great to have you on and get your insights. Appreciate it. Thanks so much. Thank you. All the violence in the Middle East spread to the West Bank, where Israeli troops and Palestinian militants exchanged fire in the town of Janine. At least three Palestinians were killed. People marched through the streets of the West Bank to mourn the victims, while back in Gaza, Israel agreed to a special request by the United States to supply two fuel tankers per day to help power the water and sewer system. But just this week on EWTN News Nightly, Catholic Relief Services warned that even if more humanitarian aid arrived in Gaza, it would not be able to distribute it unless there is a break in the fighting. We questioned the State Department about the comment. Do you agree with that assessment? That goes to the exact point we've been making, which is that there need to be expanded humanitarian pauses to allow, among other things, to allow the delivery of humanitarian assistance to the people that need it most. The State Department also told us that it is not able to offer any assessments about the condition of the hostages held by Hamas. Our complaints about alleged incidents of anti-Semitism and Islamophobia since the October 7th Hamas attack on Israel has prompted the Department of Education to launch an investigation into seven schools, among them Cornell University, Columbia University, and the University of Pennsylvania. Once concluded, recommendations will be made. The schools risk losing federal funding if they do not comply. While the White House is condemning Elon Musk after he endorsed an anti-Semitic post on his social media platform X, formerly known as Twitter. Responding to an ex-user who accused Jews of driving hatred against white people, Musk tweeted out, you have said the actual truth. Musk later suggested that he was primarily talking about the Anti-Defamation League, but did not delete his original reply. A report released by a group in Europe says since last year, anti-Christian hate crimes have risen 
by 44 percent. The Observatory on Intolerance and Discrimination Against Christians in Europe says it has evidence of 748 anti-Christian hate crimes. They allege the incidents took place in 30 countries. The organization also says Christians who express a worldview consistent with their faith have faced legal discrimination. Joining us now from Austria is Anya Hoffman, executive director at the Observatory on Intolerance and Discrimination Against Christians in Europe. Anya, good to be with you today. Uh, hate crimes documented by your group increased in 2022. What types of incidents were most prevalent? Most prevalent are acts of vandalism still, so we don't have as many physical attacks as a vandalism of churches. Which is worrying, however, is that also the attacks which take the form of arson attacks rose quite significantly between 2021 and 2022. Anya, also, I understand that you're also documenting uh, discrimination of Christians for their religious beliefs. Can you tell us a little bit more about that and the forms of persecution? Yes, we talk about discrimination rather than persecution in terms of the legal discrimina discrimination of Christians. But we do see that there is an increasing pressure on Christians in Europe, especially for voicing their religious beliefs in public. We had cases of um, dismissals from school. There were some teachers who were dismissed for expressing their Christian beliefs. But we also had cases up to court trials where Christians were actually prosecuted or reported to the police for expressing their religious views or similar things. So especially from the UK, we have a number of cases. There were street preachers uh, that got reported to the police on the so-called public order bill, which also criminalizes causing distress. And we believe that this um, overly broad legislation is really a problem for Christians who express their faith in public. And Anya, I also understand um, the Christians who adhere to traditional teachings of the church are the ones who seem to be most targeted against. Um, can you talk to us about that? Yes, that seems to be what is behind some of this legislation. So we see really a worrying increase of Christians who just face their religious beliefs that are adherent with the traditional teaching of the church, getting into trouble for that. Um, there was one case from Malta that particularly stood out to me. It's a young man who converted to Christianity and shared his testimony publicly on TV. He was then um, reported to the police, and now there's a court trial going on, which could um, lead up to five months to prison for him. And the background is that he used to be an LGBTI activist. He then converted, and under a new law in Malta, or not even very new, but a more recent law in Malta, he now got prosecuted um, for apparently com um, propagating a conversion therapy, although he was not even mentioning that, but just his mere conversion and his change of life seemed to be something that, because it's a controversial issue, is now regarded as something that under this anti-discrimination legislation needs to be criminalized. Well, Anya, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us about this really important. We appreciate it. God bless. Thank you so much. Well, the Russian Justice Ministry has filed a lawsuit to outlaw the so-called LGBTQ plus movement. In the statement, the ministry announced that authorities have identified signs and manifestations of extremist nature in the movement. This comes after Russia banned gender transition procedures earlier this year. Oh, we have a lot more still to come here on EWTN News Nightly, including status change. More than 100 years after it became a U.S. territory, Democratic lawmakers make the case that Puerto Rico should decide its own future. We have the details. And dangerous territory. Why the Vatican says we should be weary of Masonic practices. Should Puerto Rico keep its territorial status or become the 51st state of the U.S.? There is a renewed effort by Puerto Rican officials and citizens to make the change, and they are turning to Congress to make it happen. Capitol Hill correspondent Eric Rosales reports. Eric?
Well, good evening, Tracy. You know, it took six decades and many attempts before Congress passed a statehood bill and admitted New Mexico to the Union in 1912 as the 47th state. New Mexico Senator Martin Heinrich tells me that that is cause for optimism after he's introduced a bill designed to settle Puerto Rico's status once and for all. This process would allow voters in Puerto Rico to make an informed choice between statehood and independence and sovereignty in free association with the United States. Puerto Rico became a U.S. territory after the 1898 Spanish-American War, and in 1917, the island's residents were granted U.S. citizenship. Most Senate Republicans tell me it's simply a ploy by Democrats to increase their voting power. Don't you remember what we did back in grade school? 50, nifty, United States. Look, 50 is the right number. Uh, really what their ploy is, is, is to try to get a, uh, is to pack the Supreme Court. Uh, this would give them more control of the Senate. I think that's something that's been on their wish list for a long time. And, uh, of course, that would get them uh, two more senators, most likely. But Puerto Rico's governor tells me Republicans could win seats, especially in rural areas, if the territory is granted statehood. To think that a congressional delegation from Puerto Rico would be totally democratic, or it's, it's not what I expect will happen. I'm a Democrat, I'm a proud Democrat, but yet I tell you that in all likelihood it would be a split delegation. He adds the majority of people are Catholic and pro-life. The shadow U.S. senator from Puerto Rico tells me it's about educating people and getting rid of misconceptions. We are very religious people, not only Catholics, but Protestants as well, uh, and family values, hard work. So, 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 as I said, I think there's a lot of misconceptions uh, about the people of Puerto Rico in the island. The Puerto Rico Status Act has 20 original Senate co-sponsors, the most ever, but the bill has some stiff competition to reach the Senate floor amid wars in Israel and Ukraine, looming government federal shutdowns possible in January and February of next year, an unpredictable 2024 election cycle. Tracy? All right. Thank you so much, Eric. Well, reaction is pouring in after the Vatican's release of a document this week on the faithful and Freemasons. The Holy See says Catholics are forbidden from becoming Freemasons. The document was in response to a question from a bishop in the Philippines. He says many faithful there are expressing an interest in joining the Freemasons, the largest worldwide oath-bound secret society. We turn now to Father Thomas Petrie, president of the Pontifical Faculty of the Immaculate Conception. Father Petrie, great to be with you as always. So talk to us more about the Freemasons and, and why membership is not compatible with the Catholic faith. It's always good to be with you, Tracy. So Freemasonry was started in the early 18th century, and within 20 years, Pope Clement XII banned Catholics from organizing or entering uh, Freemason societies or lodges. Uh, it's easy to think that Freemasonry is like the Rotary Club or the Kiwanis Club, but it's not. It entails not only fraternity, uh, but also subscription to a certain belief system that is, in fact, counter-Catholic or anti-Catholic at times. It basically suggests to all of its members that they must strip away their religious affiliations and uh, profess that only through uh, the Enlightenment, only through Masonry do they come to find the truth. And in the American form of Freemasonry, the Scottish Rite, which is unique to America, when you get high up into the degrees, there's actually anti-Catholic ceremonies in which members are required to refer to the Pope as an imposter and as a false prophet. Um, the, the church's problem with Freemasonry from the beginning is this anti-Catholicism and also what we would call a religious indifferentism, which is to say Masonry supports the idea that all religions are false or equally false. Um, there's nothing true but what you can know through reason and rationality. 
Uh, it's not simply a, a, a volunteer club. It does entail a set of beliefs that members have to subscribe to in order to gain membership and to advance in degrees. And therefore, it's been the case that Catholics have always been held as excommunicated when they've entered Freemasonry or when they've joined lodges. Since 1983, with the new Code of Canon Law, that automatic excommunication was no longer on the books, but the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith reaffirmed in 1983 that even though you weren't automatically excommunicated, Catholics who became Freemasons were in fact in grave sin and should not present themselves for communion. Uh, this has been a problem in the Philippines uh, for a number of years, for at least 20 years. Freemasonry has been on the rise there. But it's also you know, a problem here in the United States where I think many Catholics who are Freemasons or even, unfortunately, probably some clerics think that it's just a fraternal organization like the Kiwanis or the Rotary Club, and it's simply not. Yeah, Father Peter, we're almost out of time, but I'm curious, what, why why do you think it's become so popular? And, you know, you mentioned the Philippines. Also talk a little bit more about the prevalence here in the United States. Well, I think because the Freemasonry likes to promote itself as having some connection to the Knights of the Temp of the Crusades, the Knights Templar. You know, there's a lot of movies that suggest the Freemasons are the current version of these historical secret societies, which is really not historical, not true at all. It's 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 propaganda. Um, it's 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 legend, an urban legend. Um, and so I think people kind of feel they want to be part of something greater. And, of course, there is a certain secularism in our country. And Freemasonry basically is a religion of secularism, that religion doesn't matter, that the faith doesn't matter and the church doesn't matter. And so more people are subscribed to that view and more people are seeking to be part of something larger than themselves That with other people that seem to subscribe to that view. But Catholics cannot be part of this. Oh, Father Petrie, thank you so much for coming on. Very important discussion. We appreciate it. God bless. Take care, Tracy. Up next on EWTN News Nightly, Faith on the Court. NBA player Jonathan Isaac kicks off a new line of sneakers dying in basketball and the Bible. has just launched a new basketball sneaker and it features a Bible verse. Jonathan Isaac plays for the Orlando Magic. His first sneaker is called Judo One. The back of the shoe features a reference from St. Paul's second letter to the Corinthians. The passage is from the fourth chapter and ninth verse, which reads, persecuted but not abandoned, struck down but not destroyed. Now we go now to sports agent Doug Eldridge, the founder of DLE Agency, and Achilles Public Relations. Doug, great to see you again. All right, first off, there have been many examples of athletes wearing Bible verses, maybe on their wristbands or even in their eye black. But what about sneakers? I mean, is this something new? No, I mean, not really. It, it, it goes back from cleats on the football field to sneakers on the basketball court. There's always been an honest and fervent intersection between sports and, and faith. In, in all of the, the major sports here in, in the United States. And this is not something new. Now, launching your own brand, much less a faith-based brand, that is something new. Yeah. What's been the reaction so far, Dad? Well, you know, it, it's, it's really been great, to be honest. I mean, you, you have people like, you know, national-level personalities like Sage Steele, who, who have stepped to the front and said, you know what, this is indicative of, of how so many athletes feel. And, and and not only so many athletes, but so many network people who are, are worried about expressing their faith, but feel that they can't. And I, I, I think it's, it's unique, but not a one-off, if that makes sense. And, and I think the, the outpouring of mm -hmm. support has been tremendous. And I think it's indicative of, of really the groundswell of Christianity that has always been there. You know, it's there's yeah. right, wrong or different. There's been a reason that, that that mainstream media has not covered the fervent faith and belief in, in athletes of, of every level, from amateur to Olympian to, to professional here. 
but that tide is turning and and i think for all of the right reasons and and you saw that with his launch yeah and doug i was going to ask you this do, are you seeing this more i mean do you think more professional athletes are becoming more bold in their faith 100 percent. listen i have had the privilege and the pleasure and and the humbling honor of representing Christian, Catholic, Muslim, Jewish, agnostic, and even atheist across the sports spectrum. And I'll tell you, from John Halapio, Tongan center, starting center for the New York Giants, Tongan Catholic devout, right? To Adham Talat, the, at a Gallaudet University, a Muslim, the fourth deaf player in NFL history, right? To Buddhists, to to agnostics, to you name it. And, it, you know, I, I, I've always said, because obviously I'm a man of faith, I, I think that's obviously a commonality that we share. And, I, and, and my little boy is going to be baptized on my 46th birthday, December 3rd. Like you talk about a God shining down moment. But when we talk about this, this evolving intersection between sports and faith, this is not something new. This is what's always been there. Athletes have just been apprehensive to express their faith as if they would be castigated or judged or somehow become lesser than for acknowledging that he, the mightier of, is the one over, overlooking all of this. And I think there's a comfort zone that's gradually emerging from the Steph Currys and the Tim Tebow's and the Philip Rivers, right? And you're also seeing athletes starting their own brands, Tom Brady creating his own brand, right? Allison Felix leaving Nike when they wanted to cut her salary and have a longstanding relationship with Nike by 50% when she told them she was pregnant, she started her own company, her own apparel brand, right? Even Simone Biles starting her own onesie, the gymnastics, you know, the, the Lycra business. So this is not a one-off, but thankfully it's becoming a one-off, increasingly more common. But I'll tell you, these athletes are so emblematic and so indicative of mainstream America. They want to go to church on Sunday. They want to pay their bills on Wednesday, on the 15th and the 30th of every month. They want to pick their children up from school. Like, this is indicative. There, there, there's a, a level of castigation regarding professional athletes that I don't always think hits the middle of the bullseye. And I say that as someone who's had the pleasure and privilege of representing athletes of every ilk for the last 20 years in the good, the bad, and the ugly. And, and I love the fact that they are finding the comfort and the capability to stand up, stand out, and step forward and say, this is my faith. This is what I represent. And if you believe the same thing, let me blaze a cattle path for you to follow. And that's, that's a wonderful part of where we are right now. Yeah, it's beautiful, Doug. Thank you so much for weighing in. Unfortunately, we have to, to get going. But what a wonderful conversation. And we appreciate your insights. Thanks for having me. Always great to see you. And we thank you for watching tonight. Remember, you can follow us on social media, Facebook X and Instagram at EWTN News Nightly. I'm Tracy Sable. Good night and God bless.